I'm standing beside Regina Coeli prison. And this is the prison that was used during fascist Italy to imprison Jews that were rounded up from all parts of Rome, as well as partisans and anyone else in, that was regarded as a criminal. Um, it's to north of Trastevere. And if you continue just a few blocks nor northward, you will see the Collegia Militare, which is the other place that the Jews were imprisoned on their way to the transit camps, Fossili, and then to Auschwitz. You can see the how really kind of scary and imposing this, this prison is. So let's talk for a minute about Eternal. I'll show you the cover because it's beautiful and also to show you that I actually figured out how to flip the screen smarter than I look. Not by much, but still. And uh, it's interesting because tonight was a, at Regina Coeli Prison, which is in central Rome. Now, let me tell you why that matters. First off, in itself, it's a remarkable prison. Regina Coeli, and I'm, that's probably the Latin pronunciation. You know, my Italian is not good. It means queen of heaven. Now you go, why is a prison called that? Well, it's called that because it was originally a convent and it was built in the 1600s by a pope. So it is now a prison. I think it was around 1880 that it became turned into a prison. But it is a remarkable building in every way. And during, it matters in eternal. And as you know, I'm never going to give anything away about the book because it's not out till March. But I sort of want to tell you the behind the book stuff and what gave rise to it. So that is an interesting prison for the book because that is where during as fascism was rising and Mussolini was getting everybody in his iron grip. As we talked about last week, first it was, wow, I'm going to make you feel good about yourself. You're Italian. You're Roman. You're the oldest civilization in the world. You conquered the world. That the feeling of Italianness and ultra patriotism, but had a dark side of you're going to join us or we're going to beat you up. And when he found anti-fascists, there are lots of laws against anti-fascism and informers everywhere and rewards were paid like 30,000 lira, which was a lot of money in those days. They were sent to Regina Pro Coeli prison and Jews were sent there leading up to World War II, which is touched on in the book. So I'm not going to give that away. But the point is, what is its function? That's its function. Now, what's interesting about that, and by the way, just in terms of fun fact, um, I don't know if you've ever seen those pictures of the Pope. It's even the modern day. I think four popes have been there washing the feet of prisoners. Have you ever seen this picture? Here's Pope Francis washing the feet of prisoners. There, that is taken from prisoners at Regina Coeli. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Because here's what's amazing about this place. It's what I loved about researching this book. And I think what you see in these little videos, and I'm going to sort of highlight for you now is that, you know, the sort of cliche about it's Rome off the beaten path. These are things that are off the beaten path. The truth is, Regina Coeli is on the beaten path. So is the ghetto. All of these things are amazingly right in the center of Rome, right on the Tiber. You would trip over them. But what's important about them and why I love doing these videos is that unless you know their significance, you just walk by. I've been to Rome a million times. I'm walking on the beaten path. I'm on the way to St. Peter's because ironically, Regina Coeli is about five minutes walk from St. Peter's. But I never really knew what it was and I didn't think twice to look. In fact, when I went there and did the research, I, I couldn't find the place. I got the Google thing. As I, I mentioned to my best friend, Laura was with me. We're like, where is this place? This is what it looks like from the outside. Kind of normal. I, I didn't speak Italian. Um, then I got, oh, car, car chair, I guess that's prison. -y. I look, I, I guess this is it. Then I start looking around. This is the view on the street. And I, since you're not going to get there, I kind of want to take you there a little to give you the flavor of it because you, this is a little under street, like this, this road, but this is above. This is the main drag. And right there, right there is the Tiber River. It is a beautiful, beautiful view. It's like a prison with a view. It is a prison built by a pope. It's a prison that used to be a convent. I'm saying these things because I want you to feel the irony in them, and I'll explain why for a minute, in a minute. But you, so the, the tribe is right there. Um, here's the, oh, here's one of the crucifixes. Oh, can you see that? That's on the side of a prison, of this very, very, very historic prison, a 400-year-old prison. It has grates. 
over the windows, just like a lot of the greats in Rome. You'd never think anything of it. It's in the very, very charming neighborhood of Trastevere, which is where Elisabetta lives in the novel. It's right there. Here's the front door. There's not even guards out front. And Laura and I, because we're pushy broads, we just went right in. Here's the entrance hall. Here's a, it's gorgeous. It looks like the most beautiful, like library. Like, like, oh my God, this is like, I thought, I thought this can't be the prison. But then I walked in a little more and I saw this. And then you see that guy in the blue. That's when he said, because I'm starting to take pictures, right? And he's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? He's saying this in Italian. I'm like, I I'm leaving. I guess I'm leaving because I get it. Like, you're not going to be a jerk. But it's very interesting to me because here you have this prison. You think, you know, vi visited prisons here. I certainly have for research. They're set out of the city. They're far away. They're very imposing. Um, here is this gorgeous prison. And this irony, this flip-flopping of expectations occurs throughout Eternal. Now, you're wondering why. And I'll tell you. Because not only is it true and it's history, and the historical underpinning of this novel, I take very, very seriously. It had to be factual. It had to be true. But it also mirrors what actually happened during the time. Italy enters the war on the side of the Nazis, and then later flips. There is a lot of flip, flip. This book has a lot of twists and turns. Elizabeth herself, as I think I've said to you before, if you haven't watched them, I'll just briefly remind you, Eternal is a story of a love triangle set in, fascist, set in fascist Italy. It's about what it's like to live in fascism in Italy leading up to World War II. Elizabeth, in the very first chapter, I'm not giving anything away, she's watching Marco, handsome Marco, and really thoughtful Sandro, her two dearest friends in the world. And she realizes, I think I'm falling in love. I think I'm falling in love with my friends. Oh no. What will happen? How can I choose? And if I choose one, do I, if I choose Marco, do I lose Sandro? If I choose Sandro, do I lose Marco? That's her quandary. In chapter one, she looks at Marco and in the very first sentence of the book, she's like, I think he's going to be my first boyfriend. I want him to be my first kiss. And during the chapter, lo and behold, Sandro comes along. Hi, how are you? And he kisses her. And there's an absolute flip-flop. She goes, wait a minute. I thought we were friends. Now we might be more romantic. Now, I thought I was liked Marco better. Now I like you better. That flip-flopping, and the characters flip-flop throughout. I don't want to tell you more. But that irony about it, that wrench of it, that, well, am I a fascist? Uh, and it really mirrors a lot of what was happening in Italy. Another really important example. The Jews of Italy, as I think I've said before, they joined the fascist party. Just forget about Nazism for a minute, because fascism was 10 years ahead of Nazism. Mussolini predated Hitler. And Mussolini said to all Italians, be very, very Italian, join the fascist party. We're about big business and all these good things and law and order. And there was no anti-Semitism involved in the beginning. There was nothing like that. So Jews joined it in great numbers. Then what happens is when the time goes on, and Mussolini decides he kind of was gone aside with Hitler. He still can't decide. He flip-flops throughout. And all of that is chronicled in the book. He starts promulgating these rules, and I don't want to tell you more, but the bottom line is he starts flip-flopping, and Jews who had joined the fascist party are completely betrayed. They're, because then, then the law starts to say, not only are we going to make all laws against you as Jews, we're going to say you're not Italian if you're Jewish. And that ultimate flip-flopping and betrayal is really at the core of this novel. I see somebody saying, who's that in the corner? It's Bradley Cooper. Maybe I should have moved him, but I, that's where I keep him. So that's what I wanted. I wanted that contradiction in this novel. And I also wanted to underscore something else. When you look at Regina Coeli and I say to you, it's five minute walk from St. Peter's. That's really ironic because it, you can read in the novel, what is the church's role when the Holocaust comes to Italy? I don't think that's really important. It hasn't really been given enough emphasis and you can learn about it and you will. But what's fascinating about it is, and it leads into the fact that why Jews didn't think anything would go wrong once they became fascists, because they felt, they felt nothing, but it can't happen here. War may come, but we won't be bombed. Romans thought they would never get bombed because St. Peter's was there. St. Peter's, 
the world capital, the world capital of Christendom. Nobody will bomb us. Well, the Americans bombed them. And when Italy flips sides, the Nazis bombed them. And at one point, the Italians were bombing them, the uh, Nazis were bombing it, and the Americans were bombing them. And they learned very sadly that it can happen here. I wanted to mention something else, which is a sort of a personal note, although the whole thing's a personal note. Um, this flip-flopping theme I started to talk about last week because it happened in my own family. My father was in the Army Air Force, of course, for the United States, fighting for us, flying in bombers, bombing Italy, at the same time that he was Italian-American. And my grandparents never became American citizens when they lived here because they were illiterate. And so they had to register as enemy aliens. There's another interesting flip-flop, which I think I mentioned last week, but I wanted to elaborate today because I found a picture of my dad that I wanted you to see because he looks so cute. And it does illustrate the point. This is Frank Joseph Scottolini. And that he, there he is at Kessler Field in Biloxi, Mississippi, which was training for the uh, Army Air Force, which existed then. And I know a lot of people you were saying, Oh, yes, you know, my dad was in that, too. That, that doesn't exist anymore. But there he was, and he just loved doing it, and he thought it was so important and was so proud to serve. But, um, of course, it made that, that great emotional wrench for him because he was so proud of this country, as were my grandparents. So he served it, even though it meant bombing a place where he still had relatives. That's the wrench. Because the thing is, we can talk about history on these things and behind the book, but history is alive and emotional and dramatic. And I am so proud of Eternal because I think a lot of the wonderful reviews of it and authors who have commented about it have talked about its emotionality. And honestly, really, if a book ain't going to make you laugh and make you cry and make you fall in love, uh, I don't, I don't, that's my business. 